Bonjour, mesdames, messieurs. Bienvenue au Théâtre national de la presse. Welcome to the National Press Theatre. Nous sommes en compagnie ce matin de membres du Conseil des Canadiens de la Fédération canadienne des étudiants qui vont venir euh, discuter de la loi sur l'intégrité des élections. Monsieur Gary O'Neill, directeur du Conseil des Canadiens, va débuter. Ce sera suivi de Jessica McCormick, la présidente nationale de la Fédération des, euh, des étudiantes et étudiants. Et leur avocat, Monsieur Stephen Schreibman, se joindra à nous un peu plus tard ce matin. Je vous demanderai de fermer vos téléphones cellulaires ou de les mettre sur vibration, s'il vous plaît. If you could please turn off your cell phone or put them on vibrate. And uh, after the presentation, we'll take some questions. You know the drill. Just wave at me if you want to ask something. Monsieur O'Neill, take it away. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you for being here. My name is Gary Neal, Executive Director of the Council of Canadians, Canada's largest social action organization with 100,000 supporters from coast to coast to coast. Uh, with me today is Jessica McCormick, National Chairperson of the Canadian Federation of Students. And soon to join us is Stephen Schreibman, uh, a public interest lawyer with the firm Sack Goldblatt Mitchell. <clears throat> Mr. Schreibman was counsel for the eight electors who sought to overturn the results of the May 2007, uh, 11 federal election in six ridings on the grounds that the widespread campaign of fraudulent calling, misdirecting voters to incorrect polling stations, had affected the outcome. Today, the Canadian Federation of Students, the Council of Canadians, and three individual electors will file with the Ontario Superior Court a charter challenge of the Fair Elections Act. <coughs> the recent changes to Canada's election laws in Bill C-23 will interfere with the rights of Canadians to vote in federal elections. It will eliminate access to information about the electoral process and will curtail investigations into electoral fraud. Among other things, the so-called Fair Elections Act does the following. It will make it impossible for thousands of electors to prove their address or identity in order to obtain a ballot to vote in the next election. It strips the chief electoral officer of his authority to alert the public and report to Parliament on complaints and investigations into election fraud. It makes the Commissioner of Canada Elections accountable to the government rather than to Parliament. Our challenge argues that these amendments infringe on the right to vote guaranteed by Section 3 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Charter provides that, quote, every citizen of Canada has the right to vote in an election of the members of the House of Commons or of a legislative assembly and to be qualified for membership therein." Close quote. This fundamental right in the Charter cannot be overridden by Parliament under Section 3 of the Charter, the so-called notwithstanding clause. We also allege 
that these provisions contravene Section 15 of the Charter, the equality rights provisions, since they disproportionately affect young people, seniors, and mar marginalized citizens. The measures being challenged are profoundly anti-democratic. In the robocalls case, the federal court found that there was, quote, a deliberate attempt at voter suppression during the 2011 election, targeted towards voters who had previously expressed a preference for an opposition party, close quote. The court accepted evidence that the widespread campaign had indeed suppressed voter turnout. Now, the government has legislated rules that will make it impossible for certain citizens to exercise their right to vote, and next to impossible for citizens to challenge election results that may have been fraudulently obtained. The key provisions which restrict the ability of voters to challenge election results are these. Section 7 of the bill eliminates the authority of the chief electoral officer to use any media or other means that he or she considers appropriate, other than by transmitting advertising messages, to provide the public with information relating to Canada's electoral process, the democratic right to vote, and how to be a candidate. Sections 108, 114, and 152 effectively eliminate the authority of the chief electoral officer to oversee and report to Parliament on the enforcement efforts of the Commissioner of Elections. This curtails the right of Canadians to know what efforts were made or not made to enforce the Act. Instead, Canadians will learn of such matters, including of investigations into allegations of misconduct by members of the government, only if and when the Attorney General chooses to share that information with them. Jessica. Thanks, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica McCormick. I'm the National Chairperson of the Canadian Federation of Students. The Federation is Canada's <coughs> oldest and largest student organization, representing more than 600,000 students across the country. Thank you for coming out this morning uh, for such an important issue. The right to participate in our democracy is one of the most basic rights enshrined in the Charter, and today we've come together with the Council of Canadians to protect that right. When the Fair Elect Unfair Elections Act uh, was quietly tabled on a Friday morning last February, students immediately met the legislation with interest and concern. Bill C-23 faced opposition from over 100,000 Canadians through petitions and protests, as well as calls and letters to members of Parliament. Students rallied with their communities in cities across the country, and academics and experts from around the world voiced their opposition to these undemocratic changes. This challenge is the next step uh, in a long struggle to prevent voter suppression and to protect our right to vote. Young Canadians are already woefully underrepresented in our, dem in our electoral processes. This legislation specifically targets multiple programs that had previously been working to increase uh, young voters' representation and remove barriers between students and the polls. So before I get into um, the specific pieces of the legislation that we're concerned about, there are a couple of, um, there's a bit of background I want to give on um, what we've achieved thus far in our opposition to the legislation. Uh, so uh, once the uh, legislation was tabled, <clears throat> there were demonstrations uh, held across the country, uh, and these demonstrations uh, forced our elected representatives to sit up and listen. Some of the most damaging changes uh, were reversed or amended, but the bill still puts limits on the democratic rights promised in Section 3 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, one particular change was uh, uh, an amendment to the elimination of vouching, uh, one where electors still have to provide proof of identity but may sign an attestation of address along with uh, uh, somebody like their neighbour that can uh, vouch that they live in that particular riding. However, this option doesn't go far enough. Um, we also want an amendment uh, that electoral programs for primary and secondary students, such as student vote, um, would remain intact. Uh, this same information, though, and educational programming is prohibited uh, from being made available uh, to people that actually do vote over the age of 18. So we believe that these amendments um, don't go far enough um, and that this uh, Fair Elections Act is still quite damaging. Uh, so we have a number of issues with how the legislation will prevent Canadians from accessing their ballots. 
Uh, the removal of vouching, the prohibition of the voter information card as a means of identification, um, and the elimination of education programs that encourage Canadians to vote are all dangerous changes to our electoral process. Um, so I'll just speak specifically about vouching for one second. Um, the Act removes the right of electors to prove their identity through vouching procedures. In the 2011 federal election, over 100,000 Canadians were vouched for at the polls. The vouching process provides a necessary safety net for those who don't have access to any other means of identification for one reason or another to be able to cast a ballot. Uh, students and youth in particular made use of the, this particular option. Um, between determining whether to vote in your home riding uh, or in the riding where you study, uh, living in residence without any utility bills, um, or at times moving uh, multiple times throughout the year, having to update identification and proof of address can be difficult and oftentimes expensive for students. On the voter information card, um, the Act specifically prohibits the voter information card from being accepted as a proof of, uh, of address or identity. Traditionally, we've trusted Elections Canada to run our electoral process, including testing and vetting the list of acceptable identification. In the 2011 uh, federal election, a pilot program allowed voters at specific post-secondary institutions and long-term care facilities um, to use the voter information card as a proof of identity. Uh, at these locations, over 73% of voters use the voter information card to cast their ballot. I heard many expert witnesses at the Parliamentary Committee swear to the efficiency and reliability of the voter information card program, how data was pulled um, from multiple databases to make it possibly, possibly one of the more accurate federal databases. And so in the next election, this will not be an option uh, for voters to use to prove their identity. Um, these cards are produced and delivered to voters every election um, and, and are, have in the past been used as a proof of address or at least to allow, so in the next election we would like to see this process continue or at least allow the same pilot projects that happened in the previous election to be expanded on or explored further uh, to determine whether or not they are working uh, to increase youth voter turnout and to make the process a more accessible voting process for Canadians. Any change that makes it more difficult for people to vote, um, even a change that might disenfranchise too, is a step in the wrong direction. In a climate where only 38% of youth voted in the last federal election, um, our elected representatives should be reaching out to youth and reducing the barriers to voting rather than creating more. Uh, these changes will result in many Canadians being denied their right to vote at the polls and in, and in more disengagement in, the, in a process uh, before they even arrive to vote. Um, lastly, I'd like to talk about the limitations on Elections Canada's ability to do education programs. So in what I would call a bizarre move, the Act eliminates the authority of the Chief Electoral Officer and Elections Canada from implementing public education and information programs um, that make the, the electoral process better known to the public. Elections Canada is specifically prohibited from encouraging Canadians to vote um, and must only report on the short list of information about the electoral process, so when, where, and how to vote. After hard-fought amendments, these restrictions on public education have been given an exception for youth under the age of 18. These restrictions no longer eliminate all public uh, education activities, just those that reach citizens who are actually eligible to cast a ballot. This res restriction particularly impacts those persons and groups most likely to experience difficulties in exercising their democratic rights. The Canadian Federation of Students is proud to stand with the Council of Canadians as applicants in this case. The Council is known for their long-standing defense of Canadians' rights and the Fair Elections Act is a clear threat to those rights. Uh, our Federation will continue to work with Elections Canada and community partners to increase youth voter turnout and registration in whatever way we can. But these regressive changes to our election laws must be overturned so that we can begin to rebuild faith in Canada's democratic processes. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. The most fundamental right in a democratic society is the right to vote in elections that are fair and free. It is essential to the health of our democracy that our young people and all citizens should be encouraged to get involved in the electoral process and to vote on election day. The changes to our election laws that were made by the current government move us away from that right and key objective. That's why we're challenging them in court. Thank you very much, and we'd be prepared to answer some questions. We'll start with Hélène Buzetti, du Devoir. Uh, my question would be for Mr. Fragman. Um, if, if you could explain a little bit further uh, 
the uh, legal approach you will take for this case. Uh, how can you go about this? Well, we're bringing an application to um, have uh, uh, struck the provisions of Bill 23 uh, that put in place amendments to the Canada Elections Act um, for the reasons that uh, uh, Ms. McCormick and uh, Mr. Neal explained uh, uh, for offending Section 3 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because in respect of the equality <coughs> claim, which is Section 15, we believe they'll disproportionately impact disadvantaged groups. And just follow up, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I thought that you had to add an actual case before you can go to the courts and say this law is on, you know, against the charter. So th this seems to be a proactive measure. C can you do this? No, I mean, that, that's not a, a correct characterization of charter cases. I mean, it, it, if, a, if a provision is, is interferes with the charter right, in this case the right to vote, or uh, puts in place provisions that are discriminatory against disadvantaged groups, uh, you can challenge them even if they haven't gone entirely into effect yet. In fact, some of the provisions of the Act went into effect on October 1st. Other provisions of the Act may not go into effect until December. Uh, the harm they will do, which is apprehended at this point, uh, is nevertheless uh, serious and it's certainly the type of uh, problem that courts uh, routinely consider in constitutional litigation. We want to prevent the provisions from going into effect because the result of that will be to actually prevent people from voting in the next federal election. That's a, a very serious problem and one that we want to avert. Nina Dim, Yeah, you're talking about the next election. How realistic is it that all of the the court proceedings will be done by the fall of 2015? Well, that would depend upon what happens and and who wins and and whether there's an appeal. We would hope to have a result from the court. Be, uh, well, certainly we'd hope to be in court this year and have a, have a, have a decision from the court long in advance of the next election if it actually takes place in October 2015 as scheduled. Um, we expect to succeed with this litigation and have the court, uh, um, well, we're optimistic about the legal arguments we're putting forward being, being sound and being acknowledged by the court as, as really creating a serious impediment for electors who want to exercise their democratic franchise. Uh, if we succeed in persuading the court of our position, then it will be up to the federal government to determine whether or not it wants to appeal. We would hope that it would uh, decline to appeal a judgment against it uh, and that uh, the provisions of the bill that we believe are so offensive to democratic rights and to equality rights uh, will be struck and that people will indeed be able to fully exercise their right to participate in the democratic process in the next federal election. Just to be clear, when you say this year, you're hoping to be in court this fall before, before January? Well, we hope, yes, to expedite the uh, hearing so that we, or uh, expedite the course of the litigation so we get a hearing this fall. Carl Nuremberg, the rebel that's here. Um, could either, uh, any of you, could you enumerate the particular uh, elements of the bill that you want uh, overturned by the court? I, I, I assume you're not going after 100% of the bill. You're not asking the court to remove the entirety of Bill C-23. What are the actual, just quickly, just enumerate them quickly, which ones you want removed? Yeah, I am. Um, <coughs> uh, section 7 of the bill. And that's the one that lim eliminates the authority of the chief electoral officer to use any media or other means to communicate to Canadians. And sections 108, 114, and 152 of the bill, which eliminate the authority of the chief electoral officer to oversee the commissioner of elections. Now, they just announced that the commissioner Sorry. has, we just got a news release about a, a week ago, maybe, that from the director of public law prosecution saying, the Commissioner of Elections has moved. We've got these 
the, the moving company's at the door and they've brought the boxes over and you're, we're, we, we, we're welcoming him and we've given him a coffee machine and, and he's there now. So this would mean actually undoing, the, in this case, the so-called harm, as it were, uh, if it is harm, has already happened because the, the Commissioner of Elections is now part of the Director of Prosecutions and is functioning as that, and that's, but that was actually announced the other day. Well, there are two, um, you know, different types of problems that the Act creates. One is to create new impediments to electors who want to exercise their democratic franchise. Those provisions haven't yet gone into effect. Other provisions of the Act um, remove the ability of the chief electoral officer to direct, appoint, oversee, consult with, and most importantly, report to Parliament on the activities of the Commissioner of Canada Elections, the person who's responsible for enforcing the Act, ensuring compliance with it. Um, those provisions, I, as you in note, uh, are going ahead. Um, they won't have an immediate impact on uh, the exercise of the right to vote by electors in the next federal election. So in a way, they present a problem which, a little le which is a little less urgent, though certainly a serious problem because we believe it will, th those amendments will make it very difficult uh, for the media or electors, more importantly, to learn of corrupt practices or fraudulent practices should they reoccur in the next election so that they might have an opportunity to do something about them. Uh, Mr. Neal related the provisions of the Act that are being challenged. We'll be filing um, the application with the court later today. Um, it'll be made available to anybody that's interested in seeing it, of course, as soon as we've had an opportunity to provide a copy to uh, the federal government. Uh, and you'll see the list of provisions that are being assailed. It's a complex piece of legislation. Um, in addition to Section 7, there's Section 43, which is a provision that removes the um, the authority of the chief electoral officer to designate the VIC as, uh, as a form of identification that will entitle electors to get a ballot when they show up at the poll uh, at the next uh, federal election. So there are various provisions in the Act that are being assailed, but um, uh, Ms. McCormick and, and uh, Mr. Neal described the essential problem uh, that the litigation is attempting to address and remedy. Hélène Bugetti. Don't don't leave the podium. I have a question for you again. Um, you uh, prosecuted as well the case of robocalls, and I was wondering to what extent that other case could, and, and the argument that was developed back then, and the response you got from the court could be useful for this case. Well, the uh, it wasn't the prosecution. It was we. It was it was uh, the representation of electors. Uh, who had brought applications to the, annul the result of the election. <laughs> and it, that's important because only electors and a candidate have that right. So while the, you know, the chief electoral officer and the commission of elections Canada and the deputy uh, and, and, the and, and the director of public prosecutions may pursue people who commit fraud, uh, the result of an election fraudulently won would still stand. The only way that, uh, in a way, assault on democracy can be addressed is for a judge to annul the result of the election. And the only way a matter can be placed before a judge is to, uh, is to uh, have an elector or a candidate bring an application before the judge. An elector or a candidate who is entitled to either vote or run in that particular riding. Um, we know from the election fraud case and from certainly the prosecution of Michael Sona and from the media coverage of these events that uh, the perpetrators of, uh, uh, you know, election fraud through the use of robocalls and person-to-person -person calls went to great lengths to cover their tracks. It was very much of a covert action and it was one that uh, the, the electors I represented didn't discover until 10 months after the election. Um, and, and as the court commented, it's very difficult 
a year or two years later to gather evidence about what happened uh, during the election when people have to recall, well, were they called and what did somebody say to them on the phone exactly and when did that happen? Uh, so getting timely information about uh, these types of clandestine and covert efforts to defraud people of their democratic franchise is essential. We didn't get timely enough information the last time this happened. The effect of the amendments to the bill will make it even less likely uh, for that to happen. In fact, there are reasonable, I think, grounds to believe uh, that were there to be a reoccurrence of the events that happened in May 2011, which Justice Mosley of the federal court uh, found to have occurred, uh, it's quite likely we'll, we would never learn of them. Uh, there would never be, have been uh, any litigation. There would have never been any public knowledge of the fact that, as Justice Mosley concluded, there was an organized effort to defraud Canadian electors of their right to vote across the country, not just in Guelph, Ontario. But um, I might just add that um, I noted there were three individual applicants in this case, along with the Council and the Canadian Federation of Students. And two of those are Peggy Walsh Craig from Thunder Bay and Sandra McEwing from Winnipeg, who were applicants in the earlier case. Okay. But, I, but, but I just as a follow up, it was more on the argument. Um, it seems to me that you're arguing in both cases that uh, either with robocalls or with C23, we're trying here to restrict access to voting. So I'm just wondering whether or not you think the arguments, the legal arguments, will be similar? And uh, no, they're not. The, the, uh, the applications before the federal court invoked a provision of the, of the Canada Elections Act that entitles electors to challenge the outcome of an election where they believe that irregularities or fraud affected the result. This is a very different case. This is a case that uh, contends that uh, the reforms put in place by this government offend uh, fundamental charter rights and, and, and must be struck. So the legal foundation for the case and the nature of the arguments is really quite different. The, the, uh, the litigation before the federal court is useful because it illustrates um, an important problem and our, our, our argument is that as part and parcel of the right to vote, an elector must have recourse to a remedy if that democratic right to vote is taken from them and it's taken from them uh, when they're defrauded, uh, you know, through a robocall or in some other way. And uh, in order for them to um, effectively assert that right to defend their democratic franchise, they need the help of the chief electoral officer and the information that the chief electoral officer and the commissioner of Canada elections has, and, may, and they may be the only people to have that information. So it must be made public and reported to Parliament. And it's making that information public and making reports to Parliament uh, uh, will be very difficult or impossible under the amendments that uh, the government has uh, pushed through. D'autres questions? Any other questions? A question for Jessica McCormick. Senior member. Mm -hmm.